chapter, we're going covering the same things, but we're just adding a little more complexity. Each chapter just adds a little more complexity to what we're talking about. And so we've been talking about consolidations, but now what we're going to do is add a little more um, complexity and talk about how we then consolidate them when the consolidation happens after the date of acquisition. So just a, a couple more intricacies that um, we're going to add into combining the financial statements. So um, basically, um, when the financial statements get consolidated after the fact, we're just going to have to do a little bit more adjusting to certain accounts. So that's really what this is going to talk about and we'll spend time using this worksheet that basically um, in the consolidation we know that they operate as two separate entities but when we consolidate them we have to get rid of the investment account, the asset account in the parent company and then the equity account in the subsidiary. So that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, and okay. there's a couple methods that are used to consolidate financial statements. We're going to primarily focus on the equity method, but we're going to talk about two other methods available. Um, so, <clears throat> as we know, that for each time, excuse me, I'm trying to open up my other computer. Um, for each time a subsidiary is purchased, the, there's an investment account um, in the parent company, and that investment account basically provides um, us with the information of what we acquired that company for, and then we add in our income to that account and we subtract out our dividends. So um, the company or the parent company has three options to account for this. One's the equity method, which we're familiar with. Another one's called the initial value method and then the partial equity method. Again, we're going to primarily focus on that equity method. So under the equity method, the company, the acquiring company, um, pretty much presents it similarly to how we've been doing it in the past. This initial value method, or they call it the cost method, talks more about cash flows, and the partial equity method is kind of a mixture of both. So we're going to kind of look at the, the differences here. So under the equity method, we're just going to continue doing it the way we've um, done it in the previous chapters where we accrue the income and then we record that amortization of other assets that we acquired um, that are above and beyond what the book values show. So when we purchase a company, we... Um, come up with the fair values of the various assets and then we amortize those over the life, the continued life of those assets. When we deal with the initial value method, it's just all recorded at cost and we declare dividends as income. We don't declare the income um, and amortize. So the initial value is the easiest method. And then the partial equity method really is a combination of both of them. So the main focus here is preparing consolidated financial statements. And that's what we're going to spend our time to. Um, in the equity method, which is the focal point, the parent adjusts the investment account for the subsidiary that it purchased. So the original investment in the subsidiary, as we've done before, gets recorded at the date of acquisition. And then, as we've done, we adjust it for any um, 
values that have changed when we purchase um, the company. So when we purchase the company and the the book value of a building shows up as a hundred thousand, but the fair value is a hundred fifty, we're going to adjust that and depreciate it or you know amortize various um, trademarks over their useful life, just like we've done before. We also then take a share of the income and flow that over to our books and any dividends we usually subtract out in the investment account. So here's an example of what we're going to be doing here. Excuse me one sec, I'm trying to get my other computer up. Um, so in this example, sorry one second, I just got some new computers and I they're difficult it's they have Windows 8 and I just don't like Windows 8 but it is what it is um, my server went down twice last week so needless to say I was stressed out we got a new IT we got a new IT guy in and I just don't think he knew what he was doing and um, we crashed twice was not cool. <laughs> Have you ever, has your server ever gone down? Oh, yeah. Ugh, that was awful. I could see that it's harder, harder now when your internet goes down because our phone system is one of those voice over the internet ones. Okay. <laughs> that would be a bummer, you know? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this example. <laughs> Parrot Company obtains all the outstanding common stock of Sun Company on January 1st of 2014. Parrot acquires the stock for $800,000 in cash. And so we see the various book balances of Sun Company and then the fair values like the trademarks are increased $20,000, the technology is up $130,000, the equipment, based on the book value, the fair value is less, and the liabilities are the same. So, as you see here, we've got what we call our net book value of six hundred thousand. The fair value is seven twenty, but we're buying it for eight hundred thousand. Okay, so basically, in this scenario, what we're going to do. It, oh, so initially the purchase included, as you see here, um, the they purchased it for eight hundred thousand. We see the fair values of seven twenty, and the difference is going to be allocated to goodwill. Okay, so um, that was the initial. Now. Um, if then Parrot acquires 100%, as you see here, we've got the net book value, the differences we're going to allocate to the various assets at their fair value, and then if the rest goes to goodwill, the $80,000. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the way we're going to allocate that amortization is when we're dealing with trademarks and goodwill they we consider have an indefinite life so we're not going to allocate those every year but our patented technology since it has um, a 10 year additional useful life here we're going to allocate that 13,000 and our equipment since it's gone down in value we're going to reduce that six thousand because it was at was it one fifty and it went down to one twenty or one eighty to one fifty. Since that value has decreased, we're going to allocate um, the subtraction of that. So technically, we're going to amortize seven thousand a year based on those fair values. Um, once that equipment gets reduced to 
um, after five years, then all we'll be dealing with is the patented technology after that. So, the journal entries to record this purchase, we start with a debit to investment in Sun Com Company on Parrot's Books. We credit our cash. Then, when we receive dividends under the equity method, we reduce our investment in Sun Company by those dividends. So you see the dividend receivable is a debit. We credit our investment in Sun. Once the dividend's paid out, it, it, um, it just zeroes out the receivable. Then when we report the income in Sun Company, we increase our investment in Sun as the asset mm -hmm. and we credit our equity and our subsidiary earnings because that's part of the equity section of the balance sheet. Then those allocations that are made to um, offset book with fair value, we debit our equity in the subsidiary and we credit our investment company as we utilize up those, um, those allocations. So, basically in this scenario, this is pretty much everything we're kind of familiar with previously. So, what we need to do when we consolidate these two companies, there's a series of journal entries we need to, to do. We're going to begin by getting rid of the subsidiaries equity section. Then, <laughs> we're going to recognize any unamortized allocations that were related to the fair value adjustments. We then need to eliminate any income that we accrued, the parent accrued, eliminate any subsidiary dividends that we showed, and then any excess amortization expenses we have to adjust. So. Basically, what we're going to be doing here, excuse me, uh, we will um, go in first and we will, to eliminate the equity section of the subsidiary, it's normally got a credit balance, so we're going to debit the common stock of Sun. We're going to debit our additional paid in capital in Sun, debit the retained earnings. <clears throat> so that eliminates the equity section of the subsidiary, and the offsetting credit is going to be on the parent company, will eliminate the investment in the, the subsidiary company. So those two will offset each other because we're trying to consolidate these financial statements. Then. Right. Um, after that, the next thing we're going to do um, we're going to take some of the assets that are on the um, parent company and so the trademarks, the patented technology, and the goodwill that we added because we have to create it at fair value, we are going to, um, sorry, I'm sitting here looking, reading while I'm doing it. We need to basically, in that acquisition method, we increased our trademarks by 20,000. We increased our patented technology by 130,000. We show goodwill in there of 80,000 and our equipment got reduced by 30. And so basically what we're doing is in combining these financial statements, we are going to show now the true values of those assets or the reduction in the assets and that will increase those assets in the subsidiary and then the way we allocated that initially into as a debit into the investment 
um, in the, the parent showed that on the books, we need to eliminate that. So if we increase those assets in the subsidiary, and then we decrease our investment in Sun, that pretty much then is another entry to wipe out that asset in the parent company. Then, entry I gets rid of the income that was recognized by the parent company. Um, because really what we want to do is um, show the, the two of them combined as one company. We'll also get rid of any dividends that we had initially eliminated or reduced our investment in. Um, because again, since we're combining them as one, we need to adjust both sides of the books. So we're treating them as a single entity. So anything related to the investment that the parent company shows on the books, we need to get rid of. And any of the corresponding entries between the two, we need to get rid of. Then after that, um, any depreciation or amortization we take needs to be adjusted too. The best way is going to be to go through a, a problem here. So we're going to we're going to we're not going to go on to the initial value let, yet. Let's look at an example of this in let's see here. Um, in the book. So <coughs> let's see here. So let me find a problem that Okay. Okay, let's look at number 16. So number 16 is going to basically um, show us this equity method. So in this, Haynes obtained 100% of Turner Company's common stock on January 1st by issuing 9,000 shares of $10 par value common stock. Haynes shares had a $15 per share fair value. On that date, Turner reported a net book value of 100000 However, its equipment with a five-year remaining life was undervalued by 5000 in the company's books. Turner had developed a customer list with an assessed value of 30000 although no value had been recorded on the books, with, and that has an estimating, estimated useful remaining life of 10 years. So it shows us the two companies' revenues, expenses, um, and dividends. Now, if we look down here, um, the following figures come from the individual accounting records of these two companies as of December 31st, 2015. So this information is December 31st, 2014 when they acquired the company. And then this information here is a year later when we need to consolidate the financial statements, how are we going to report this? So the first thing we're going to need to do is figure out how we allocate everything. And then from there, um, create some adjustments. So the first question says to us, oops, what balance does Haynes Investment in Turner account show on December 31st, 2015 when the equity method is applied. So again, they purchased it in, in December 31st, 2000, or excuse me, um, January 1st, 2014. So we're dealing with two years here. Um, it, it was purchased in January of 2014. So what we need to do is calculate the investment account after two years of of being consolidated. So the first thing we're going to do here is go to, I'm pulling this up, 
First thing we're going to do is allocate it. The acquisition value, if we go back here to the book, they obtained 100% by issuing 9,000 shares at 15 bucks a share. So 9,000 shares at 15 bucks a share would be 135,000. Okay? So we, we know they purchased it for 135,000. They're telling us that Turner's book value was at 100. So the first thing we're going to do is see 135,000 is what we bought it for. The book value is 100. So we have excess of fair value over book value of 35,000 we're going to need to allocate. From there, it tells us how um, a couple issues here. One is Turner, um, the equipment was undervalued by 5,000. <coughs> so that's part of our 35,000. And then there's this e customer list of 30,000. So our equipment we're going to amortize over five years, 5,000 bucks or 1,000 a year. And our customer list of 30,000 is going to be amortized over 10 years. So as you see here, we'll show our equipment for 5,000 bucks, our customer list for 30, which basically this makes up that why we paid the difference. Our amortization each year is going to be a thousand bucks on the equipment and the customer list is going to be three thousand. So we need to go back and remember we when we initially purchased it this was January 1st 2014. Okay? So we need to do um, journal entries to record the investment at the end of 2014 because here's one year and then also at the end of 2015. So we see in 2014 the revenues Turner made were 230,000. The expenses were 120 which is a net of 110 and the dividends declared were 50. So at the end of the first year what we'll do as you see right here, we start the purchase or the investment in the company at 135. This is the um, this is the investment in the in the subsidiary. That's what the first thing we do. Then at the end of December 31st, 2014, we're going to show the income from the subsidiary of 110. Remember, we subtract our dividends of 50. And then we have to take our allocation, these amortization figures of forty or of four thousand, and subtract that. So at the end of December 2014, we would have a balance of the 135 plus the 110, so 245, minus the dividends, so 195 minus the amortization, so we would be at an investment at the end of 2014 of 191. But it wants us to know what our investment is at the end of 2015. <coughs> so then we'll also need to go in here and show the income allocation of the 280 minus the 150 or 130. Okay. And we'll also have to subtract our dividends here of 40 in this one. So as you see here, we've got our 130 got accrued. And then our dividends declared minus 40. And then this amortization again of 4, we're going to subtract out. So as of the end of 2015, the parent company on their books would be showing an investment in Turner of 277000 So basically what we're doing here is we're covering two years. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. 
So it's just it's the same concept. We're just going over um, a two-year period to see where we would be at at the end of that time. <coughs> now the next question says, what is the consolidated net income for the year ending December 31st, 2015? So again, now we're not dealing with just the parent company. We're dealing with how will we consolidate the income for both companies. So as you see here, the net income of Hayes, 240, which we're coming up with 240 by um, the, the 700 minus the 460. Then Turner's is the 280 minus the 150 or 130. So we've got the 240, we've got the 130, and then we'll have to take our equipment and customer list, the 1,000 and 3,000, because we have to amortize those. So our new consolidated net income as of the end of 2015 would be 366. Okay, because remember, consolidating the books, we kind of have to wipe out the investment piece and the of the parent, the equity section of the subsidiary. So we're really just taking their true net incomes, but we do have to take into account the fact that we are showing those assets higher on the books or an increased amount on the books. Okay, the next part then says... Um, what is the consolidated equipment balance as of December 31st, 2015? How would this answer be affected by the investment method applied by the parent? Well, we see um, as of the end of 2015, we, sh we see Haynes equipment is 500. Turner's here is three hundred thousand, so we've got the five hundred, the three hundred. Then um, allocation based on the fair value. Up here, do you see how we increased our equipment by five thousand dollars? Yeah. And um, the depreciation, though, we've taken on this equipment for two years was a thousand a year or as of the end of 2015 it was two thousand dollars of depreciation or accumulated depreciation so our equipment as of the end of 2015 would be both the company's equipment balances plus what we had to allocate at fair value when we purchased it the five minus that accumulated depreciation we've already taken Okay? okay? Yeah. It gets a little more confusing, but it's the same concept. I'm not going to worry about the initial value method yet. Okay. Okay. So, um, let's go back now to the initial value method. So, that was the equity method. That's the most complicated. When we use the initial value method, it's not allowed to be used for reporting purposes. This is only being used internally within the companies to keep track of their records. It's not going to ultimately, no matter which method they use internally, the consolidated financial statements that are prepared for the public are going to all result in the same figures. It's just the manner in which they get there can be different how they how they choose to do their internal books can be various methods but ultimately the consolidated figures will ultimately be the same no matter which method they internally use so basically they can use this initial value method or partial equity method um, 
like it says here, the either of these methods changes the balances recorded by the parent over time, but neither of these approaches affect any of the final consolidated balances reported. Just three parent accounts vary because of this method. The investment account will be um, changed. The income recognized by the subsidiary is going to be different. And the parent's retained earnings is going to be different. But again, no matter which method, our consolidated financial statements presented to the public under all methods will ultimately be the same. So when we use <coughs> this initial value method, which is the easiest, basically the parent records the subsidiary's activities different. No adjustments are recorded in the investment account for the current year income. Dividends paid by the subsidiary or amortization of purchase price allocations. So under this method, when we initially um, purchase a company, under this method, they don't even record, they don't add to the investment account the income from the subsidiary or they don't subtract the dividends or any amortization. The only thing that they do is related to the dividends. Any dividends that are received get recorded as revenues. They don't record any income from the company. They just utilize any dividends that are paid out or revenues. So there's only um, there's there's all a couple entries to eliminate um, and to prepare the financial statements, but the two entries that are going to be different from the method is the I entry. Entry I eliminates the parent's dividends and the subsidiary's dividends paid account, and the D entry that we record under the equity method getting rid of those dividends just doesn't need to happen. So everything else is the same except instead of them showing all the income from the subsidiary over to the invest the equi the investment account and the parent, that doesn't happen. All they're really doing is getting rid of that dividend between the two companies. The partial equity method is actually let's stop and go in and look at this um, initial value method so we can see how this operates. Okay, D says if Haynes has applied the initial value method to account for its investment, what adjustment is needed to the beginning of the retained earnings on a December 31st, 2015 consolidation worksheet? How would this answer change if the partial equity method had been used? How would this change if the equity method had been used? So it's asking us what adjustment would need to be made to the beginning of the retained earnings on December 31st, 2015. So as you see here, if the initial value method was applied, the parent would have recorded a dividend of 50000 You know, under the equity method, we took the, the income, subtracted the dividends. So basically, what's different is under the equity method, we take the income of 110 and we subtracted out the dividends of 50 Okay? Yeah. Under this initial value method, the only thing we would do is they would have recorded 50,000 in dividends. So basically, um, income gets understated by 60,000 using the initial value method than it would the equity method. Because when we show, um, under the equity method, we show all that income, 110. Under the initial value method, they only show the dividends they get. Also, that amortization expense under the initial value method doesn't even get recorded. Okay? So, 
under this initial value method, the 56,000 is would be an adjustment because they only are recording 50,000. They're not recording the 110. And then that amortization isn't happening. So the difference between under the initial value of 50,000 versus under the equity of 110 is a difference of 60,000. Now, under equity, we would then subtract this 4,000 um, amortization. So the difference of the 60 minus the 4 is 56. So in order to adjust the worksheet, we would do a debit to investment and turner of 56. And then we would get rid of our equity section of the, the subsidiary by crediting 50, excuse me, investment and turner. Yeah, we would debit that. And then our retained earnings um, of 56 would make us then match up to the equity method. Again, I'm going to focus primarily on the equity method here. Um, this next slide talks about the partial equity method. The difference with the partial equity method is entry I is a little different because we get rid of the parent's equity in the subsidiary's income and we try to get rid of the investment account. And then also we're going to get rid of, under the partial equity method, it also um, only accounts for dividends as income. So in that case, we would have to eliminate the dividends there. Remember, entries S and E are the same for all methods, and the investment and income account balances really differ for those other methods. Now, again, the best method is the equity method because the initial value or partial equity methods really don't give all the whole picture. Um, so, oh, let's see, other concern. So I think what we're going to do is go through some problems. This slide basically tells us after a, a company's been acquired in the years after that, we've got to take into account the revenues of both the expenses we need to um, adjust for. We need to eliminate the investment account in the parent. And we need to eliminate the retained earnings account in the subsidiary. And then with the assets, we're going to keep them. We're just going to adjust for what we purchased that subsidiary for if any values increased. We're going to um, get rid of any goodwill in the in the subsidiary and adjust the capital stock. If we show we've got um, some equity in that, anything related to the combining of those companies, we've got to remove because we need to treat them as one. So. Basically here, let's go back and I think the best way, were we going to do 17 as a homework assignment? I think. Let me look. I have it right here. Okay. I believe 16, 17, and 30. So that's pretty much all I want to cover for 16. <coughs> but let's look at 17. <coughs> okay, now on 17, Francisco acquired 100% of the voting shells of Beltran on January 1st, 2014. In exchange, Francisco paid 
450,000 in cash and issued 104,000 shares of its own $1 par value common stock. On this date, Francisco's stock had a fair value of 12 bucks per share. So basically, it's telling us that they purchased it for the 450 plus 104,000, so that would be 120, it's about 100 and higher math here, 104 plus 12, this is a little embarrassing, but 104 plus 12, get into my Excel. So that times 100, yep, 124, 1,248,000, and they also gave cash of 450. So they basically purchased the company for 1,698,000. Does that sound right? One million six ninety eight. Yes. Okay. Okay. The combination is a statutory merger with Beltran subsequently dissolved as a legal corporation. Beltran's assets and liabilities are assigned to a new reporting unit. The following reports the fair values for the Beltran reporting unit. Um, for January 1st, 2014 and December 31st, 2015 along with their respective book values. So they don't seem to be operating as separate entities. It looks like Beltran was dissolved. So Belt, or excuse me, um, yeah. Let's see here. The following reports the fail values yeah, for In the state, Francisco's got combinations of statutory merger with Beltran, subsequently dissolved as a legal corporation. But I think what they're doing, they're dissolved as a legal corporation, but they're still um, keeping on their on their books. They're showing uh, their information. They're being recorded separately. So, okay. when we initially purchased it, it shows all the various assets here. And then it also shows, um, as of December 31st, 2015, it's going to show the fair values and book values. Okay, so our job is to prepare the journal entries to record the assets acquired and the liabilities assumed in the Beltran merger as of January 31st. 1st, 2014. So we see here, here are all the fair values of everything that was purchased. Okay? So if we go here and look, we'll see we purchased it for the 1,698,000. Okay? Okay? Then what we, we need to do is go and figure out what we acquired in fair value of the assets. So if we go here and we take the cash, the receivables, the inventory, patents, relationships with customers, the equipment, and then we also assume their liabilities. So if we take all these, we've got a minus 571 in, in liabilities, 5, 6, 7, 1 million. 1.2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We're basic, well, we're just going to, instead of adding it, here's how it worked. We basically assumed 1,298,000 of assets minus the liabilities. So what we paid above and beyond is 400,000. Since we bought it for 1,698,000, and the fair value of the assets and the liabilities we assumed were 1298 
we're going to show on our books a goodwill of 400000 just because since there wasn't any determinable fair value in excess, it's going to automatically go to goodwill. <laughs> now it wants us to show how do we record this on the books of the parent. So we're going to take all the fair value of all the assets so we can just go down the list and show cash of 75,000, the receivables of 193, our inventory of 281, patents of 525, customer relationships of 500, equipment of 295. To make it balance, we've got to increase our goodwill of 400,000. We will credit the two liabilities we're assuming, the accounts payable of 121 and the long-term liabilities of 450. We paid cash of 450. Then we're just going to break out the common stock was a dollar par value. So we will increase our equity section by 104000 for the par value. And then the additional paid in capital, that's the difference between the par and what the fair value was. We will credit of 1144000 That makes sense? Yeah. Now, um, I, I know I'm switching around here. Um, I now want to take a minute and talk about goodwill because this is going to be the next thing that we're going to be dealing with. Goodwill has an indefinite useful life and we don't amortize goodwill. But one thing we want to do is we never want to overstate our books. If, you know, the conservative approach is to always understate our assets or understate our income. So we have to test for goodwill every year to make sure <coughs> that goodwill isn't what we call impaired. That what we show as goodwill on the books is in fact accurate. So the one way we do that is each year we need to see is our goodwill still the value we're showing it to be or is it possible that that goodwill has been decreased in value. So we have to run this test every year. What happens is when we think goodwill has been impaired, the way we have to test for it is when some of the subsidiary gets sold or more importantly if there has been a decline in value in the books then we have to test for goodwill impairment and if goodwill doesn't come in at what we assume the value to be we're going to have to show a loss on the books so the way we calculate this goodwill impairment is we, cre we figure out the fair value and we compare it to what we call the carrying value in the consolidated reporting unit. Does the fair value exceed the carrying value? If it does, then we're fine. But if the fair value is less than what we're showing on our books, then we have to take another step. And basically, we have to allocate the fair value of the reporting unit to all the assets. We then have to subtract the fair value from the fair value of the reporting unit, and that's what our goodwill should be. If what we the, what we call the implied goodwill is less than what we show as reported on our books, then we may have to um, create a loss. So the key here is, and you know this happens a lot 
in companies where they purchase something, um, a, another company with a great amount of goodwill, then the economy takes a dive and that company might not be worth what we, they initially reported it as. So the difference, we've got to write that goodwill off as a loss on the books. So step one, evaluate events or circumstances to determine whether it is more likely than not that the fair value of a reporting unit is less than its carrying amount. You know, so the true value, is it less than what we're showing on our books? Is it more likely than not that the fair value of the reporting unit is less? If it is, then we need to calculate and compare what the fair value is to what we show on our books. And then if in fact the fair value of the unit is less, is the fair value of the unit, reporting unit, less than its carrying amount? If it's not, then we're fine. We don't need to do anything. But if the implied goodwill, or what we calculate the today's at today's amounts, is less than what we've recorded on our books, then we have a loss. And with that loss, we're going to have to recognize that as a loss, the difference between what we imply our, our goodwill to be versus what is shown on the books, if that's the case, then we're going to need to create a report that. Here's an example. <laughs> We've got three different units. We've got um, DSM wire, DSM wireless, and vision talk. We show the goodwill for each of these three units and the fair value when we acquired them. It shows the 950, the 748, and the 502. New call tests for goodwill impairment of DSM wireless. The implied fair value of goodwill is compared to its carrying value using, using the following allocation of the fair value of DSM wireless at year end. So if you see here, DSM wireless at year end shows um, the net assets, current assets, property, equipment, subscriber list, patented technology, liabilities, long-term debt, so we show on our books a fair value of 600, but when we take and assign the various assets, we come up with 596. So they're not quite hitting the mark. So since the fair value is less than the carrying value, we're going to have a, a reduction in our goodwill by $4,000. You see what I'm saying? Uh, excuse me here. Yeah. Um, Four million. Yeah. Four million. We had a carrying value of 155, but because we our assets are today the fair value is under, we are going to have to then show an impairment loss of the difference. So we started with a huge goodwill here here let me just go back here we started here with fair value here of 748 okay at DSM wireless and so now as we're looking here we've got a fair value the 600 instead of the 748 and when we create our various um, identifying them we're going to have to write off that goodwill because we don't have that fair value today so that's a huge impairment loss of 151 which that was a huge to have goodwill of that amount anyway 
So when now instead of goodwill being recorded at 155, goodwill's now just valued at four thousand four million. Four million. Four. So Newport reports a 151 million dollar line item, goodwill impairment loss on the operating section of its income statement. Now they have to explain in the statements why, you know, that impairment happened and then how they're valuing it. So that's the one other piece in this chapter is dealing with goodwill. Um, let's see, I'm not going to worry about that right now. Okay, we're not going to worry about under IFRS versus GAP. So let's go back now to this problem and then discuss the goodwill aspect. So it says here, on December 31st, 2015, Francisco opts to forego any goodwill impairment qualitative assessment and estimates that the total fair value of the entire Beltran reporting unit is $1,425,000. What amount of goodwill impairment, if any, should Francisco recognize on its 2015 income statement. So they're saying that as of the end of 2015, the fair value is 1425000 So if we look here, they have 1425 is what they show the fair value. The book value gets recorded at one million five eighty five. Now let me see because the how did we calculate one million five eighty five? I'm just seeing. Did it give us that information earlier? Here, if we take these assets here. This should total our one million five eighty five. Or this is the book value on the books. Do you see what I mean? The two seventy five, five seventy five, one million seventy five, one point five twenty five, one point seven sixty, two point one. Yeah. So this is how they came up with that figure is by taking these totals that were given to us. So if the mm -hmm. fair value is at 1425 but on the books we show 1585 well we've got an impairment here. Okay? So then what we do from there, we look at the fair value of the reporting units then we take the fair value of the reporting unit's net assets without goodwill, and the difference here is 100,000. So if we show our books have a goodwill of 400,000, which is right here, and yet we can show that our net assets without goodwill are down 100,000, we're going to have to then show that we have an impairment loss of 300000 because we don't have that value anymore that we once did. So we only have an excess here of 100000 where with our goodwill previously we had a $400,000 goodwill. The difference is going to need to be written off as a goodwill impairment. Does that make sense, kind of? Yeah. Yeah, what threw me was the book value. But then I realized the book value, we're dealing with the fair value. Correct. So like, well, why isn't it 160000 But yeah, I see it now. Mm -hmm. Okay, then the last one I want to look at is 30. 30. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Now, 
Excel, I'm going to send you an Excel file for this one. Okay. It makes it so much easier to use the template. Mm Okay. Now, next week, let's, if it's okay with you, let's plan on like a three hour session, if that's okay with you. Um, just so we can... Yeah, no, that's perfectly fine. Have you emailed that template? I am doing it right now, dear. Sorry. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, I'm emailing it to you right now. You must have emailed me this morning and I didn't see it. I'm sorry. That's okay. I was just double checking. <laughs> so you should have gotten it. Yeah, let's we'll see it. Let's we'll got it. Good morning, honey. Okay, I'm going to cheat a little. Okay. Okay, so let's look at number 30 here. Giant acquired all of Small's common stock on January 1st. Over the next few years, Giant applied the equity method to the recording of this investment. At the date of the original acquisition, 90000 of the fair value price was attributed to undervalued land while 50000 was assigned to equipment having a 10-year remaining life. The 60000 unallocated portion of the acquisition date excess fair value over book value was viewed as goodwill. Following our individual financial statements for the year ending December 31st, 2015. On that date, Small owes Giant $10,000. Small declared and paid dividends in the same period. Credits are indicated by parentheses. So, we're basically... Um, Let's see. On the date of the acquisition, 90000 of the fair value price was attributed to undervalued land, so we would have been amortizing that piece. No, excuse me. We can't amortize land. Duh. That would have been increased. 50000 was assigned to equipment having a 10-year remaining life, so that amount would be a depreciation. The 60000 unallocated portion of the acquisition date excess fair value of her book was goodwill. And it also shows small owns owes giant ten thousand dollars, so that's going to have to be eliminated. 
How was the 135,000 equity in income of Small's balance computed? So, equity in income of Small. Giant shows 135,000 equity in income of Small. How did we compute that? Baby, where are you going? Filling up the wood burner? So, how did we compute that? 30. So basically, what's been given to us, as you see here, undervalued land was 90. The equipment was increase of value of 50. Goodwill, 10, 60. Small O's giant, 10,000. So, Basically, how we calculated the 135,000 equity on small is going to be 90,000 in land. Right. We've got 50,000 in equipment with a 10-year life, so that's amortization of 5 a year. Goodwill of 200. So, I'm just sitting here seeing our excess amortization of 5. 5. But I don't see how that's 135. So, let me see what I'm... Okay, so basically our 200,000, Giant uses the equity method. The 135,000 equity and income of small reflects a 140,000 um, equity accrual. So we got that from... <laughs> Here, net income of 140, right here. Yeah. Okay. And then we have the amortization of 5,000 gives us okay. our 135,000 of equity. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Next says, without preparing a worksheet or consolidation entries, determine and explain the totals to be reported by this business combination for the year ending December 31st, 2015. So what we'll do is we'll take our revenues, we're going to go through each item and figure out how we're going to combine the two of them. So. If we go back here to this form, our revenues are really going to just be both revenues added together. Yeah. Same with our cost of goods sold. So if we'll look here at the cost of goods sold. It's going to be the combination of the 550 plus the 90. Okay. The depreciation expense is going to be the combination of these two plus the excess amortization of the equipment of 5,000. So it, sh it should be the 172 and 130 plus the 5 should give us our 307. Okay, as we look at equity and small, we're going to wipe that one out. Okay, we don't want an equity when we're combining them. Our net income is going to be our consolidated revenues, 
the 588 plus the 140, which would be 728. 588. Consolidated expenses are subtracted from consolidated revenues. Let's see here. Oh, it would be 588. Guess why? Because we're the 135, the equity in small is already in here. Okay. So technically, it's just going to be 588 because as you see here, that equity in small is really going to be revenues for small. So, in other words, if we got rid of this 135, okay, and we added our whatever this new figure would be minus the 135 because that's Small's figure, and we, we took that difference plus the 140 and then subtracted that amortization on equipment, we'd come up with 588. So, uh, what's basically happening here is Giant's already allocating Small's revenue right in here. So that's why we're totaling 588. Okay. Then, let's go back. The retained earnings will only be on the parent side. So giant, so one million six hundred ninety-five thousand, which would be the only thing we're going to show us retained earnings. The current assets are going to be added together, but it told us that um, one of them owes. Who is it that owes the ten thousand dollars? The subsidiary owes. $10,000 to Giant. Small owes Giant $10,000. So Giant is going to show $10,000 in their current assets, an extra $10,000. So we're going to want to add these two current assets together, but we're going to want to subtract that $10,000 between the two of them since on Giant's books, their accounts receivable is going to show 10000 from small. We're going to want to eliminate that. So as it says here, the current assets, both book value balances get added together while the $10,000 intra-entity receivable gets eliminated off the books. Does that make sense what I'm telling you? Right, yeah, I, yeah. Okay. Correct. Giant. Correct. Okay. Now we're going to get rid of the investment in small on the on Giants books. They have an asset investment in stock, the small. We need to get rid of that because we don't want to show that when we're consolidating. Right. The land. We're going to add the numbers together. But then we also have to take into account the allocation. Yes. Okay. Buildings we're going to add together. The equipment is going to be added together, but we also have to take into account that allocation of what's not yet been amortized on that equipment. So if we go here and look, at the equipment, we have six forty eight and our two eighty six. So six forty eight, two eighty six, four, three, nine, thirty four. Um, but Like, we have to allocate equipment of 50000 Right. And 934 that would be 984 And how much have we used up? Um, so the amount, 
that we have used up or that we've allocated to amortization would be reduced. So our equipment is only going to be the net, or both the book balances, plus whatever of this 50000 has not been utilized. We're dealing with this as of December 31st, 2015. And this, amort okay. this company combined um, on 2011. So as of, think of this, in January of 2011, they merged. And so amortization was taken on 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So five years of amortization was taken, but it's got a 10-year useful life. So there's really only um, 25,000 of this left. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, goodwill, the original amount is going to be shown there. Our total assets are just going to be a total. The liabilities, well, the total assets are going to be totaled less that intra, you know, that we already took out. The liabilities, we're going to have to take away that 10000 that's shown on the subsidiaries account. Right. The common stock is only going to be the parent companies. The retained earnings of one million six ninety five <laughs> is going to be over here. The parents balance at the beginning plus any consolidated net income less any of the consolidated dividends declared. So that is just going to be the parents plus whatever consolidated net income came minus any dividends, which is going to be the 1695. And then the liabilities and equity are just going to basically be t the totals of what we've already come up with. Again, any intra-entity transactions have to be taken out, which makes sense. Yeah. Now, the next step we need to um, create a consolidated worksheet. So, we know our consolidated totals over here are going to be from what we've calculated through all of here. You know, our revenues of 1535 we know that that's going to be what our revenues are. So, our revenues are just going to be a combination of both companies. Our expenses are going to just be a com our cost of goods are just going to be a combination of both. Now, the depreciation expense is going to be a combination of both plus the $5,000 of um, allocation for the equipment. So this E entry would show a debit to depreciation expense and it's going to show a credit over here to do accumulated depreciation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that is how we are going to show our new depreciation. We do have an adjusting entry here with a debit to depreciation, a credit to accumulated depreciation. Our equity in s income in small needs to be zeroed out. So to zero that out, we'll debit the 135. And our corresponding um, account is a credit to investment in small. Because we want to get rid of that investment in small on the parent's books. So that will zero that out.
the retained earnings section should only be that of giants. So the way we handle that is we have to zero out Small's retained earnings by debiting it and ultimately just end up with the retained earnings of giant. Our net income is going to be combined. But our dividends declared, we need to get rid of Small's dividends declared. So we will credit those dividends to just have the dividends declared of Giant. Under our current, am I going too fast? A little bit. I'm sorry. The dividends declared, mm -hmm. basically, we need to wipe out um, the subsidiary's dividends. The small. Mm -hmm. 110. 110. With current assets, everything's good except that intra-entity accounts receivable that's sitting on Giant's books we need to reduce of 10,000 and the corresponding entry to that 10,000 is going to be over here against um, Small's liability so we're going to debit accounts payable or the liability section credit our current assets to wipe out both sides of that intra-entity transaction. Because on one book it's an accounts receivable, on another book it's an accounts payable, so we're just going to wipe the two out. Okay. Okay. To give us that 706. The, let's move on to land. I don't want to do investment in small yet. Because, you know, we know we need to wipe out investment in small, but we've still got a couple journal right. entries. So our land was increased 90000 during the acquisition wow. method. Our equipment now has a $30,000 increase. But then we took an amortization of five. So basically, on our books, as of the end of year, one, two, three, four, as of the beginning of the, this fifth year, we had 30,000 of an adjustment in our assets. But then at the end of the year when we took this amortization, we're now down to 25. Right. Okay. And during the acquisition, we show our 60,000 here for goodwill. Then the only other thing we have to do is wipe out the common stock section of the subsidiary by eliminating the subsidiary's equity. So we only want to show the common stock of the parent here. So this S entry to eliminate the common stock of the subsidiary is showing up um, the 170 plus the 620 gives us this S credit of 790. I'm going to make this a little smaller so you can see it better. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
You tell me when you're ready, because I think I was going way too fast. Yeah, I'm just double checking. Yeah, I'm trying to do some of the formulas in here to make sure I'm yeah. So let's see what the last part says. If, okay. if Giant determined that the entire amount of goodwill from its investment in small was impaired in 2015, how would the parents' accounts reflect the impairment loss? How would the worksheet process change? What impact does an impairment loss have on consolidated financial statements? So as you see here, it's basically going to say that the worksheet should basically not have goodwill in it anymore. I'm just trying to see where it gives us... Basically, what we would end up doing is if we end up with a loss, we would show goodwill impairment loss and we would credit our investment in small would be reduced by 60000 So we wouldn't have goodwill sitting on our books anymore. So our asset, that investment in small, would decrease sixty thousand. Um, let's see here. If I look over here at what we did, we have, do you see here how we have a $60,000 Goodwill sitting on our consolidated? Yeah. But if in fact we um, had an impairment loss, how it would change is we wouldn't have this 60000 on our assets anymore. That would be reduced. Um, and it, we may have to adjust. I mean, it, that asset would be reduced. Or, here, let me go back here to this. If all goodwill from the small investment was determined to be impaired, Giant would have to make this, this on the books. After this entry, the worksheet process would no longer require an adjustment to recognize goodwill. The impairment loss would simply carry over to the consolidated income column. The impairment loss would be reported as a separate line item. So this journal entry would get rid of our goodwill and it would create a loss on our income statement for that purpose. So we would have a we would have less net income and we would no longer show goodwill on our financial statements. This honestly is a can be tough because when you logically think how they need to be combined, it makes sense. But to then begin preparing these journal entries can get cumbersome because you've got so many adjustments to make. But I like this chapter because if you take each account and you say, how do we consolidate it? It makes it pretty straightforward. You can logically think through, oh, we just combine them. Or, oh, 
said we need to take into account that amortization. This can, can kind of boggle your mind with all the various journal entries, but it makes sense that we only want to keep the equity section of the parent. We want to wipe out the investment shown in the parent. We need to wipe out the equity section of the subsidiary and then any intra-entity transactions we need to wipe out also. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, next week we're going to take this a little step farther. And what happens is, with next week we're going to start talking about when two companies are selling products to each other. So it's the same concept, it's all about consolidating the entries, but there may be certain entries relating to sales we need to get rid of if one company sold another company inventory, but they haven't eliminated that inventory on their balance sheet. So we're, we're staying with the same concept, we're just addressing some different issues related to a parent and a subsidiary in their transactions. Does that make sense what I'm telling you? Yeah. Any questions? No. I just have to kind of work through this problem again with this template. Just so I I'm going to email you. No. I'm going to email you um, the Excel solutions, and I'm going to email you this work, sh this um, solution also. Okay? Yeah. I, I mean, this template is helpful. At least I can see where things are coming in and out. But now I need to go back, and I kind of need to just start from the beginning and watch. Right. You know the flow of it. I will email these to you right now. So, um, let's plan next Saturday morning at 8, if that's okay with you. Sure. And then we'll cover four, I, you know, if we can cover four and five, what I might do is just hone in on one or two, pro, you know, one problem instead of covering so much. Yeah. Um, but let's just plan on that. And you email me if you have any questions. <laughs> 